let's take some notes on this. If we are in the circumstance where I have three objects, all of the same mass, all uh, with the same coefficient of friction with their surface, and I tell you that they're all on this ramp together, they would all experience a normal force that is equal to mg cosine theta, where theta is the angle of the ramp. Correct? Now, let's say the disc and the ring are rolling and the block is stationary. Um, I'm saying that because that would require us to talk about the static frictional force. Something that is rolling, by definition, has a point that is instantaneous at rest with respect to the surface. That is the definition of rolling. Do I have to say that again? If I have an object that is rolling, it must have a point that is instantaneously at rest if something is rolling. It must have a point that is instantaneous. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Instant, I spelled it wrong again. Instantaneously at rest with respect what do you say? If something is rolling, it has to have a point that is instantaneously at rest with respect to the surface. That's a long sentence. I'm understanding that perhaps I speak too quickly. But this point is instantaneously at rest. Then the object experiences a torque and turns a small amount, so the next point is instantaneously at rest. Because I understand what's happening with rolling is that there's always a new point that is instantaneously at rest with respect to the surface. Now, these three objects, two are rolling, one is stationary, because we're talking about static friction. So, mg sine theta minus friction. mg sine theta minus friction. mg sine theta minus friction. This has to be true for all of them. Newton's second law is a law. Therefore, whether it's rolling or sliding, still has to obey this rule. Now, friction is less than or equal to mu times the normal force. We're talking about static friction. They all have the same normal force. Do they all have to have the same frictional force? No, they can have any frictional force that is less than or equal to mu times the normal force. We know this one equals zero. Right? It's not sliding. It's static friction. This one equals ma, and this one equals ma. Which one is greater? This one. The one with the ring. Why? The ring made it down slower. It took longer to get there. It accelerated less. Friction had to be more. And why? You said it. It's harder to turn the ring. It takes more friction to keep this point at rest because the ring is harder to turn. You guys follow that argument. It's a good argument. You should be able to make that argument. To keep that point at rest requires friction. It takes more friction on the ring because the ring is turning. Now, the truth is, I want you to be able to tell me what the size of that frictional force is. And we started doing that the other day, but didn't finish. I want to finish. I want to get an expression for the size of the frictional force. There are three forces acting on the ring at that point. There is, and I'm using the ring as my example, but I could use the disc. It's your call. We're going to mathematically do them all. There's the normal force. There's the frictional force. And there's the weight. 
And I don't think it's a particularly difficult argument to make as to why they all point in the direction I've drawn them. Are we all okay with that? We understand why friction has to be up the ramp. It has to be in a direction that would prevent one surface from sliding past the next. That has to be up the ramp. Also, you might think of it that the friction is, might be causing it to turn. And what direction would friction have to cause it to turn? Well, if I wanted to accelerate down the ramp, friction's got to cause a torque in that direction. However, studying this, we have a force expression that we can use to study it. That force expression has acceleration in it, and we don't know the acceleration. It's different for these two objects. Zero for the box, but it's different for the two objects. That we know the disc and we know the ring, they have a different acceleration, and we don't know what the value is. So we're going to have to study the rotational part of this. The question is, do you want to choose a pivot point about the middle or a pivot point about the edge? So I gave thir third period the chance to pick that, and I forced sixth period to take the opposite of theirs. Third period said edge. Surprised, the, surprised me. I thought for sure they'd say center. Um, we have seven minutes, eight minutes. I want to do the center so I have a good uh, discussion of what the difference is between the edge and the center. But what I'm going to do instead is we're going to do both. We're going to set up both. You can do either one. You only have to do one of them. But you can frame it from the center of the, the ring, and you can frame it from the edge of the ring. So first, let's ask a couple of questions. Let's deal with the center first. If I'm doing net torque with the pivot point at the center, does the weight cause a torque? No, because it's at the pivot point. Does the normal force, which is one radius away from the pivot point, does it cause a torque? No. It's at an angle of zero degrees relative to the torque arm, correct? So it causes no torque. Does the frictional force cause a torque? Yes, bingo, it does. So, so let's just put that to the side. Let's write the torque equation. Net torque equals I alpha. We'll leave I for a little bit. Uh, the torque here is going to be radius times friction equals I times A over R. Good so far? Do you see why that is? Um, if it was a ring, I get that. All right, that's for a ring. If it's a disc, I get this. All good? All right. Tuck that to the side for just a minute, okay? Zoom back in here. Let's switch that pivot point so that we are now at the edge. If I'm at the edge, do you all recognize that the normal force and the frictional force do not cause a torque relative to the edge, okay? That means that only the weight is causing a torque, and it is one radius away from the edge, correct? So, looking at that, I notice um, uh, right away that the only force is the weight, but it's acting at an angle. Do I have to work hard to convince you that this angle is the angle of the ramp? That it would have to be? Okay, good, so that's theta. So when I construct my torque equation, so this is pivot at middle, this will be pivot at edge.
my torque equation will be torque arm, R, times force, mg, times the sine of the angle between the torque arm and the force, sine theta. This has to equal I times A over R. Any question about where that came from? That's still net torque equals I alpha. Do need to have a bit of a side parallel axis formula coming at you, right? We're at the edge. So the edge of a disc will be MR squared plus MR squared or 2 MR squared. Edge of a, I'm sorry, that's edge of a ring. Thank you for not correcting me. By me discovering it, the mistake never happened. Edge of a disc will be 1 half MR squared plus MR squared, which is going to be 3 halves MR squared. Now, if you're trying to write notes, you don't have to write all that down. Just write that you have to use the parallel axis theorem to shift the, the moment of inertia to the edge. Because now I gotta, I gotta do this for the ring first. R, M, G, sine theta equals two M, R squared times A over R. Cancel out all that garbage and get M, G, sine theta equals two M, A. That's a ring. How about the disc? We'll do them both. RMG sine theta equals 3 halves MR squared times A over R. Pretty close. MG sine theta equals 3 halves MA. All right, that's the disc. We've done them both ways now. Our job is to figure out which one has the bigger frictional force. Well, we either use this and this. Actually, let me draw it different. We either use this and this, or we use this and this. Doesn't matter to me which one we use. So I'm going to pick one of them. I'll expect you to do the other. Got it? So how about the fact that we have the acceleration here? That seems like the fastest way to go. So acceleration equals one-half g sine theta. I should have written that in yellow to be consistent. So let's be consistent. This one. Acceleration equals one-half g sine theta. And mg sine theta minus friction equals MA. So when I solve for friction, I get one half MG sine theta. Now, you guys can pack up, but because I'm going to post this video, I'm doing the other one, which is MG sine theta minus friction equals m times two-thirds g sine theta. That's solving the disk for its acceleration. Solve that for friction, and I get one-third mg sine theta. One-third mg sine theta. That's a disk. That's a ring. More friction for the ring than the disk. So regardless of which way you go about dealing with the rotation of the disc or the ring, clearly it takes more friction to turn the ring. Let's, um, let's evaluate what you were supposed to do here. First, there is a problem here within this that you did a lot first semester. So if we take the pulley part out, you should have been able to fashion a force problem. 
apart from the pulley being in there, which is why when I see things like cosine in the answer or no sine theta in the answer, I know we've got an issue. So let's begin with the idea that I, you're supposed to lay out all the forces that are acting on each object in your system. I'm not going to go all the way back to first semester and talk about drawing the forces as they're supposed to be and then putting in a coordinate system and all that stuff. You don't have time for that. You need to be able to jump a little bit ahead. But there are only three forces acting on this object. And they are weight, normal force, and tension. I go to the other object, there's only two forces acting on that object. Tension and weight. Now this part of the problem, this, this one that is the, the, the inclined plane problem, the Atwood machine problem that's sitting in the middle of one that has a pulley in it, this you should be able to set up without any difficulty. Now, again, I'm not going to put the coordinate system in there and do all that work. You should remember how to do that. If not, you, you're sitting on your notes. They're all in there. Look them up. It comes down to mg sine theta down the ramp and tension up the ramp. And should they be unbalanced, that's going to equal ma. I'm supposed to assign direction to. So I'm going to say down the ramp is positive. In fact, I'm going to make that my blanket direction for the whole problem. That way is positive. Over here, tension mg. Since I chose down the ramp to be positive, I'm going to go ahead and say that the tension upwards is greater than the weight, and tension minus mg equals ma. Now the box that's sitting on the ramp is 2m, so its inertia is 2m. But there's a pulley in the middle. <coughs> now, what's the net force on the pulley? Zero. That, that shouldn't be a hard question to answer, and I shouldn't have to wait much time on it. The pulley didn't go anywhere. So the pulley experienced a net force of zero. You shouldn't ignore the fact that there are four forces acting on the pulley. Two tensions weight, and whatever the axle is applying to the pulley. Being asked to figure out the normal force from the, the uh, axle on the pulley is not an uncommon question. So you would have to know that there are three other forces that are balanced by that normal force. And I know you're thinking normal force is up. Well, not in this case. There's a force this way. There's a force this way. There's a force this way. But then there's also a force that way. It wouldn't be uncommon to be asked to figure out what this normal force is. But the force is summed to be zero because the pulley stays in place. On the other hand, the net torques aren't zero. And that's what makes me have to say that this is tension two and this is tension one because there must be an unbalanced torque acting on the pulley in order for it to experience an acceleration. So I'm going to have a tension downwards in this direction. And I'm going to have a tension along the ramp in this direction. And the one along the ramp, this T1, is greater than this T2. Now we have to do a, a net torque relationship. But we've done some torque problems before. I don't feel like I have to start from scratch. The torque arm for the pulley is the radius of the pulley. The thing causing the force on the pulley is tension. And I don't have to worry about the angle. It's a pulley. So RT1 minus RT2 equals I alpha. But I go more than that. I know that the pulley is a disc, and that means one-half m r squared. I have to use the mass they gave me, which is 3m. 
which is why I wrote the word mass out, just to make sure you would remember that. And instead of alpha, I'm going to put A over R because Yemo asked the question, does the string slip along the pulley? And I said no. That's what solidifies A over R for alpha. That allows me to clean this up. And when I clean it up, I get a torque equation that looks like T1 minus T2 equals 3 halves MA and 2 MG sine theta minus T1 equals 2 MA and T2 minus MG equals MA. Now, you should have a skill set that you can use to bring these together, but your arithmetic is really showing through here. So try to do things that might make this easier on you. I've given you a tool to use. If you've been careful, when you line these up, you should be able to just add them together. Yes, you could do substitution. That will take you longer as you solve and figure out what am I substituting into what. It is going to always be easiest to eliminate the internal forces and go straight for the acceleration, even if that isn't the order they ask you to do it on the exam. It will always be easier to do it that way. So do it that way. Look, I'm going to make this clear. I've asked the same group of questions on all of your homework. I've always asked for you to find the acceleration and the tension. Please understand, I've been throwing you slow ball pitches for the last couple of days on this stuff. Your entire homework was based on just slow ball stuff. I've asked the same thing. Do you think the AP exam is going to stick around just asking you acceleration and tension and stuff like that? They are likely going to change it up a bit. We need a couple days to see the change up problems. The ones that are actually challenging. This is not challenging. Right? This is prescriptive. And every time I saw you write something down, right now I'm just putting out dead air so you can write down a note next to everything you corrected so that when you do this again, you have something that you could study that would help you not make those same mistakes. That's why I'm wasting this time for you to get caught up and write down the things you need to know. So I see T and negative T and negative T and T. When I add all these up and I add the left sides together, all of those are gonna cancel out. I'll be left with 2 mg sine theta minus mg equals 3 halves m plus 2m plus, get that out of my way, plus m times a. I just added all of those things up factored out the A. I get net force equals inertia times A. Newton's law, I should always see it in there somewhere. These were the two things that caused the motion of the system. Tension is internal. Um, I'm gonna factor out the MG here on this side and get two sine theta minus one equals, let's add all those together, three halves plus four halves plus two halves 9 halves MA. I can get rid of the M's and say that A equals 2 ninths G times uh, 2 sine theta minus 1. That's the acceleration of the system. Again, this was not a particularly difficult question. It had stuff in it, sure, but not a particularly difficult question. The next one at least requires some thoughtful analysis, but you needed this first. What is the condition where the block that's hanging will fall? Well, that would have to be an acceleration in the opposite direction, right? This term right here, this part, this determines whether our acceleration is positive or negative. You have to look for stuff like this in your relationships, but that will determine it. If everything that parentheses is positive, the acceleration is down the ramp. If everything that parentheses is negative, the acceleration is up the ramp. 
There is nothing else here that could make the system negative. Right? That, that's something you must understand. G is always going to be a positive number in the right way in which we're using it here. So when we work it out, the only thing I can determine whether it's positive or negative is what's in that parenthesis. So that tells you something very clear, that something special must be happening when this equals zero. Right? Because that's the threshold. If it's less than zero, we know it accelerates up the ramp. If it's more than zero, it accelerates down the ramp. So at 30 degrees, that's the threshold. If the angle is less than 30 degrees, it, that block falls. If that angle is more than 30 degrees, the block goes up and the block on the table goes down. Right? You can solve that. You solve that for theta. So what is the condition? Make the angle less than 30 degrees.